Oh, you so totally nailed that. Way to go. Oh, man, I was actually scared. Like, I wanted to crawl into a hole and hide when I walked up in front of the class. Are you serious? You seem so confident up there in front of everyone. I could never do that. I'm so afraid talking in front of people. Yeah, I was totally freaked out walking up there. But you know how it is. You get going and the nerves kind of disappear. When Andre shouted out, yeah, that's right. I mean, that was the moment where I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I can't explain it. I just loved being up there. You kidding me? You almost got mugged when you were done. Everyone thought you were amazing. You're going to be a politician or something. Molly was happy her friend was so successful speaking in front of the class, something she herself was very afraid of. Jade had given her presentation on the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement, filled with her family stories from slavery to the civil rights movement to the present day. She had been active in the BLM movement with her parents. It had been a very bonding experience for them. Jada had been very passionate in her presentation and her class went wild with approval when she was done. Jada was over the moon. It had been last period. Jada and Molly walked out to the front of the school. Molly gave Jada a quick hug. She was so proud of her and said goodbye. Molly walked over to her grandfather's car and Jada started walking to her bus. But as Jada was walking past, she heard Molly's grandfather say, I see you've got a little colored friend now. Then Jada heard the car door slam. Jada kept walking. She didn't look. She pretended she didn't hear anything. On the bus home, she sat by herself and didn't talk to anybody. Kids from her class came by, telling her great job on her presentation. She gave them a quick smile and looked away. She was so mad. She had to be. If she let herself be hurt, all the other kids would see her cry, and that wasn't going to happen. She barely said hi to her grandma when she got home and went straight to her room. When she hadn't come out after a couple hours, her grandma knew something was wrong and came in. Hi, Grandma. I'd kind of like to be alone right now. I'm sorry. Jada's grandmother told her that she knew that was how Jada felt, but that sometimes it's better to talk about it. Grandma, why do they do it? Jada just couldn't keep it in anymore. She'd been trying to process it for the past two hours. It was killing her. She hadn't shed a tear since it happened. Now they all came out at once. She buried her head in her grandma's chest and was wrapped in her grandma's generous, loving arms. She and her grandma talked for the longest time. Her folks were both working late that night, so it was good to have her grandma to talk to. When she was all talked out, her grandma brought her dinner to her room so she didn't have to talk to her brother and sister. She loved her grandma so much, but her answers were from her beloved church, and they weren't Jada's answers. Mostly, it was just good to feel her grandma's love and have her share Jada's pain. Alone again, she still couldn't stand the pain. There was perhaps one thing that might help. She picked up her phone and sent a text. Molly, you there? No response. Maybe she was eating dinner. Maybe she'd text in a bit. Jada waited and waited. No response. Was it possible? Could her best friend in the world have accepted her grandfather's prejudice and decided never to talk to Jada again? No, she couldn't believe it. Molly would answer. She had to. Jada spent most of the next hour, the longest hour of her life, staring at her phone that wouldn't bring her the message she needed. Finally, in desperation, Jada texted one more time. Molly? It was true. Not only had she felt the sting of such great prejudice, but it led to her losing her closest friend. Jada laid her head on her pillow and cried and cried. After what seemed forever, she cried herself to sleep. The next thing Jada knew, she was in a room she had never been in before. It was mostly empty, but somehow she knew she was safe there. Then there was someone there. She was in long, flowing robes and had skin of the most beautiful mahogany gold hue Jada had ever seen. Who? Who? I've been sent to help you. Help me what? Help you answer your question. 
what's my question? It's your question. You tell me. I want to know why there's so much hate. Why do people hate you when they don't even know you? Why would someone do that? It's the great riddle. People have been trying to figure it out for millennia now. They still haven't found the answer. The great riddle? What's the riddle? It's simple. It's the one question each person must answer while here on Earth. Who are your people? That's it? That doesn't seem so difficult. I know. We think the answer is so obvious. But people keep getting it wrong. Every generation gets it wrong. How can you get it wrong? It's forced on you. I'm black. My people are black. It's not like I have a choice. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it will always be. I know that now. Really? Darnell is your people? No. There's no way. There's no way Darnell and I are the same. Darnell was a bully and the biggest jerk in the school. Now Jada was confused. It was obvious that she was black and black folk were her people, but there's no way she had anything in common with Darnell. She looked at this amazing being in front of her. I'm confused. Why did you come here? I was sent because it's time that people discover the answer to the great riddle, and you've been chosen to explain it. Now you're just confusing me more. I don't know the answer. Yes, you do. You've known it all along. Look, people are black or they're white. They're liberal or conservative. They're religious or not. They're partiers or studiers. You're accepting everyone else's answer. Don't look to them for your answer. You know it. It's time to tell everyone the real answer. Speak up, Jada. It's time to spread the word. The next thing she knew, her alarm was ringing and Jada was back in her room. Had one of her grandmother's angels come to talk to her? Was her subconscious mind playing tricks on her? She had no idea what to think. She did know that she was confused, very confused. What was all this talk about the great riddle and her people? The dream had left her energized and excited when she woke up. But by the time she made it to school, she was as depressed as ever. She couldn't get the sound of Molly's grandfather out of her ear, and all she could feel was despair at the thought that her best friend had abandoned her because of the color of her skin. Then, as she got off her bus, she saw Molly. She seemed to be there waiting for her to get off. Molly came up to her with a big cheery hello. Jada said a quick hi and kept walking. Molly grabbed her arm and stopped her. Jada! Look at me. Jada looked up with expressionless, empty eyes. Molly's eyes immediately grew wide with alarm. Oh my god. You heard him, didn't you? Yeah, I heard him. Oh no! I could barely sleep last night. I was worried all night long that you heard him. Really? If you were so worried, why didn't you answer my text? I couldn't! My grandfather and I argued all the way home. Then, when we got home, my father took my grandfather's side. I ended up yelling at them and telling them that they were both racist bigots, and my dad took away my phone. Oh, Molly, when you didn't answer me, I thought you were going to follow your grandfather and not have anything to do with me. I couldn't stand it. I was crying all night. Jada got the biggest, most welcome hug ever. No way. No way. That's never going to happen. My family can all be bigots. They're never going to come between me and you. Jada broke down crying and hugged her friend back. It didn't matter if people looked. She had her friend back. Welcome to Nero's Fiddle. Episode 14, The Great Riddle. We're going to have to wait until we get closer to the present to find out Jada's answer to The Great Riddle. But today we're going to take a little break from our chronological walk through Western history and examine a fundamental aspect of human nature that we're going to have to understand if we're going to figure out how we got to here. 
I'm talking about our tendency to classify societies into hierarchical classes. We could have covered this at almost any point in our tour down post-agricultural human history, but the great chain of being is a medieval concept that exemplifies the human tendency to rank societies hierarchically. I think it makes now a great time to discuss this tendency. The standard view of the medieval world is that it was divided into those who rule, those who fight, those who pray, and those who till the ground. Those who ruled, the monarchs, dukes, counts, depended on the peasants who tilled the ground for their food and their sustenance. Both peasants and nobility relied on those who fight, the knights, to go to war when necessary and keep them safe. The knights counted on the nobility to pay them so they could train and obtain their weapons and war horses. And of course, the clergy depended on everyone to pay their tithes so they could survive. And nobles, knights, and peasants all relied on the clergy for the religious services that bound all of society together, made it function, and gave it purpose. This view, however, is too simplistic. It's a little like saying that people in 21st century America are governed by a president and Congress. True enough as far as it goes, but it tells you virtually nothing about the complexity of American government. For the people of medieval Europe, theirs was an incredibly rich world filled with not only a complex society, with a hierarchy of men and women filling social niches, but also an entire world where every living creature from the highest king to the lowliest worm digging in the mud took its place in an incredibly rich hierarchy ordained by God. A world in which each person and each creature was assigned a position above those who were inferior to it and below those who were superior to it. I've said before you just can't understand a historical period unless you're able to get into the heads, at least to some degree, of the people who live there. Nowhere is this more true than in the medieval world, and the medieval mind just can't be understood without understanding the great chain of being. It's also worth noting parenthetically that sometimes we think we would like men or women of a particular historical period. Generally speaking, this isn't true. We live in a post-civil rights world in which most of us see someone like Molly's grandfather as being unnecessarily bigoted and have a very strong negative reaction when we interact with them. This is especially so when they treat people from other races or economic classes despairingly. In almost every pre-industrial revolution culture, however, people lived in hierarchical societies where it was taken for granted that God had ordained that certain people were social superiors and others were inferiors. It was expected that social inferiors would be servile, and superiors would treat inferiors condescendingly. Inferiors would accept such treatment with patience. It was the divine order of things. And after all, unless you were a serf, you got to treat your social inferiors like that as well. It's just what you did. I'm not just talking about medieval England. I'm talking about every pre-enlightenment, non-hunter-gatherer society. We'll see what starts to happen with the social order when we get to the Enlightenment. So, the great chain of being. As everybody in medieval Europe knew, God created man and woman and every creature that walks, swims, slithers, or crawls on the earth. Not only did he create them, but he placed each of them in their place, a divinely created order of life called the great chain of being. At the head of the great chain of being was God himself. Who could be higher than God? It was he who had created the world and ordained the order of all its denizens. Below God were the angels and heavenly beings. For the medieval mind, there was a host of heavenly beings, and they all had their own complex hierarchy to organize them. Cherubim, seraphim, thrones, powers, etc. Below the heavenly host, there were humans. At the top of the humans, there was the king, and then his queen, for the pope would be at the top if you belonged to the clergy. Below the king and queen were the dukes and duchesses. At every level, the male was above his wife but she was above the next level down in the great chain of being. For example, the queen was above a duke, the duke's wife, the duchess, was above a count, etc. Anyway, this chain continued down the degrees of English nobility, duke, marquis, count, viscount, and baron. Below the baron and baroness were the knight and dame. Of course, though a dame technically holds the same degree of nobility as the knight, the lowest degree of nobility, 
she is lower on the great chain of being than a knight. You might think the great chain is simply filled out by freeholding peasants, serfs, and slaves after that. This would be far too easy for the classifying English mind. All the merchants, traders, blacksmith, and other townsfolks were needed and were provided their particular link in the chain, though they weren't quite as clearly defined as nobles, clergy, knights, and peasants. Don't forget that those who were designated as savages needed their place. I'm not sure if it was above or below the slave, but they were there too. As I indicated, the great chain of being didn't end with slaves and savages. The lowliest human was higher than the highest animal. But the chain kept going down the animal kingdom. First mammals, followed by birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and bugs. You guessed it, each species was appointed its own niche within the chain with great carnivores like lions at the top and small pests like mice towards the bottom. Done now? Of course not. This is the British mind that will one day explore and categorize the whole world during the Age of Discovery. The great chain of being goes on to categorize the plant kingdom, then finally inanimate objects such as rocks and dirt. Done now? Of course not. Where did we start? With God, so naturally we have to end with Satan. But before we get to him, we have to classify all the underworld host of malign spirits and demons, just as the heavenly host were all assigned their places in the great chain before we got to humankind. There, now you have the great chain of being in a nutshell. But I'm afraid I'm not doing it justice. Not even getting into how the moon and heavenly bodies and the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, play into the concept. My purpose here is not to get lost in the weeds but to show how complex this concept was. But more than to show how complex it was, I want you to understand that it was crucial to the medieval psyche. They couldn't imagine life without it. I don't think we have a great analogy today, but perhaps think of it as liberty and freedom of speech. We couldn't imagine living in a land where we were not free to live where we wanted, choose our occupations and our friends, and speak our minds. So it was with the medieval mind. For them, the great chain of being was how they made sense of their world. When every man and woman was in their place, God's order was guiding the world, and they felt at peace. This is a problem with many people studying historical cultures. They want to imply modern worldviews on historical psyches. That leads to so much misunderstanding of history. We look at ancient cultures and see perhaps a freeholding peasant with a modest plot of land and a humble two-room cottage for her family of six with all of the limitations that existed on a peasant woman, and think, that's so unfair, I could never be content with that. She must have hated it. Wrong. That's attributing our modern worldview to a medieval peasant. Peasants had always been peasants. There never had been mobility between classes, and our peasant woman had never spent time wishing she could be a dame. Her god was there watching over her. She was surrounded by her loving, caring family. Most were probably satisfied in their world. I can remember George W. Bush in the lecturing tone he used to adopt when talking about Saddam Hussein's regime, justify the Iraq war by saying something like, every person longs for the blessings of liberty. I thought at the time, this is why we shouldn't elect presidents who don't understand the lessons of history. As far as I can tell, no country that has been described as tribal, which was an adjective that was still used to describe much of Iraq at the time, has transitioned well into democracy. Generally speaking, the desire to have the freedoms we associate with democratic government didn't exist until after we had gone through the Enlightenment. With very little exception, if any, yearning for the blessings of democracy was largely a post-Enlightenment, post-Industrial Revolution development. Until then, the English were happy with their place in the Great Chain. At this point, it's worth taking a brief detour to look at Indian social hierarchy. The English concept of the great chain of being was intricate and complex. But believe it or not, the Indian caste system was even more complex still. The Indians separated themselves into 3,000 different castes. These 3,000 castes were then divided into 25,000 subcastes. Each one was based on a specific occupation. Every aspect of religion and much of everyday life was determined by the caste one was born into. Upper caste Indians would not eat with or sometimes even accept their food from lower caste Indians. 
Upper caste Indians always lived and operated in separate communities from lower caste Indians. The Dalits, or untouchables, were outside the caste system and were so excluded from society that they were forced to live in separate villages. They couldn't even drink water from the same wells as non-Dalit Indians. They were called untouchables because just the touch of them was considered to be extremely polluting and required a complex ritual to make one unpolluted again. In some areas of India, they were considered so polluting that even the sight of them polluted the upper caste Indian who saw them, and they were forced to have a nocturnal existence. We've talked a lot about in-groups and out-groups. So did counts consider peasants to be an in-group or an out-group? And what did counts and dukes think about their knights? The answer to these questions is more subtle. Think of your high school. At the high school football game, all of the different social groups sit in the bleachers and cheer for the home team. They're all one big in-group. Yet the next day at lunch, different groups sit separately and may gossip snarkily about each other. We can call these in-groups and out-groups, but then we'll be missing a great deal of subtlety. As far as I can tell, the Count and his peasants got along well for the most part. Did peasants gripe at their lord on hot summer days when they had to give the lord the labor that was due, and they knew they needed to harvest their own crops before the rain came? Sure. But we gripe about our own family members sometimes without thinking of them as outgroups. I don't know that they all considered each other as outgroups when all were functioning in their positions. That was the point of the great chain of being. When everybody was functioning well in his or her position, God's divine order was maintained and all was at peace. It was when someone stepped out of their place that the great chain of being was upset and that anger flared. This would happen during civil wars or when a serf fled his lord's lands. I've spoken here about social hierarchies in medieval Europe and India because they're the best examples we have of pre-modern cultures segregating themselves into such social hierarchies. But the practice of segregating society into separate hierarchical social classes, and for those higher on the social scale to look down on lower classes, was ubiquitous. It happened in every pre-modern culture. The ancient Romans had a phrase I'd translate as, he knows his place. This was a compliment. This phrase was used for lower-class plebeians who knew their place in the Roman social order and were subservient to the equestrians and patricians above them. It was always the case that lower-class citizens were considered good when they were subservient to the upper classes. In addition, I've never seen anything written indicating widespread discontent on the part of the lower classes. There's an exception, of course. Peasants rebelled during times of food shortages or famine, excessive taxation, or after catastrophes like the Black Death. Usually they were led by someone outside of the peasant class. I don't know if such studies have ever been done, but perhaps someday neuroscientists will study the brain processing in-groups and out-groups. One study might go something like this. Subjects are placed in fMRI machines that can scan the brain, and they're shown pictures of different social groups. One group of subjects might be church members, or shown pictures of their church at last summer's church picnic. The same brain areas that light up when we feel the comfort of our family and friends would presumably light up. Next, this group might be shown pictures of a gathering of atheists. Now, instead, the portion of the amygdala that processes fear begins to light up. The reverse would presumably result from a group of atheists being shown pictures of their summer picnic and then pictures of church services. We're comfortable with our own tribe. We're uncomfortable when we step outside our tribe. This has driven people to separate themselves into different social groupings and classes since the first towns like Jericho and Uruk were founded. It's a prime historical driver and can't be ignored when evaluating what has shaped and continues to shape our history. Every week we stop by some historical period that has helped us to get to where we are today. There are many historical periods we've simply passed by. Amazing amounts of gray matter were poured into biblical exegesis in the medieval period in which Europeans were developing their incredibly nuanced great chain of being. This interpretation included interpreting each verse literally, analogically, meaning what does it tell us about the future, 
i.e. when Christ will return, etc. Then events of the Old Testament are connected with some analog in the New Testament. And finally, the verse is looked at morally. What does this passage tell us about how we should live our life right now? More thought was invested in this kind of interpretation than any other issue, by far. Why don't we spend an episode on the issue that fascinated the denizens of the Middle Ages so much? The answer is that we don't really care. All of that study left nothing that future historical periods would really care about. The great chain of being, however, did have long-lasting ramifications for Western society. Remember that we're looking for historical drivers. What are the cultural factors, human motivations, geopolitical dynamics, and economic components that drive historical events? As we noted, the human motivation to segregate ourselves into separate categories, and for those with more economic and political power to dominate and exploit those with less power, has been a constant in human history. Like everything else, with the inevitable rise of societal compassion, this motivation has lessened over the centuries. But stay tuned. It'll get worse before it gets better. Does it still play a role in society today? I don't know. Let's revisit that when we look at the modern BLM movement. This week's read is The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Okay, not exactly on point for this week's subject, but written during this time period, and definitely worth a read. For peek into the lives of everyday medieval people, you can't beat it. It's very enjoyable and definitely worth a read. Enjoy. This week I want to thank my amazing cast of voice actors. The part of Jada was played by Miara Simpson. Molly was played by Lauren Chu. And The Visitor was played by Deborah Elizabeth. Our narrator, as always, was my amazing partner in this podcast, as in life, Alice Barnes. Many thanks to you all. See you next week.